Hi, everybody. My name is Linda Abraham, and I am the president of Accepted and the moderator for today's webinar. The webinar is Welcome to is Ask Me Anything with Michael Robinson, Columbia Business School's MBA admissions director and proud member of the class of 2001. Now, Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Now, a few valuable pieces of information before we start for our listeners. Michael and, or I may ask a few questions during the Ask Me Anything and also ask you to raise your hands in response. You can do so by clicking on the hand icon, two icons underneath the horizontal orange arrow on your control panel. Please raise your hand if you would like to earn your MBA at Columbia Business School. Please raise your hand if you would like to earn your MBA at Columbia Business School. Okay, great. The overwhelming majority of you figured out how to raise your hand and are here for the right reasons. So thank you very much. Okay. Um, now we are also, we want to learn a little bit about you before we start. So I'm gonna launch a poll. And the question is, when are you planning to apply? This year, next year, or sometime in the future? Okay. Oh, we got a lot of very interested people here. I'm going to close the poll. I want to hit zero, five, four, three, two, one. With 76% having voted, 95% are applying this year, and 5% in the future. And I also would like to know what which of the programs at Columbia Business School are you most interested in? The traditional August entry full-time MBA, the January entry full-time MBA, or the executive MBA? Okay, can we get the, we're at 69%, can we get a little bit higher? All right, great. With 80% voting, five, four, three, two, one, with 88% having voted, here's the results. So it's 82% for the full-time MBA. Um, and 14 for the early decision and 5% for the executive MBA. Okay. And then what industry do you see yourselves most likely to go into? The options are consulting, entrepreneurship, financial services, tech, or others. Okay, here we go. Again, the options are consulting, entrepreneurship, financial services, tech, or other. We have 76% having voted, five, four, three, two, one. I'm gonna close the poll and we got up to 83%. So we have a really active audience here. 16% are consulting, 32% are entrepreneurship, 40% are financial services, 12% are tech, and zero or other. Okay. I guess I, I guess we chose the options well. There's no others there. All right. And now, now leading academicians and top-notch practitioners, dynamic lecturers, and fascinating opportunities for experiential learning, all at the heart of a world-class university and the city that never sleeps, as well as the business capital of the world. That's Columbia Business School with Wall Street, Madison Avenue, and the entrepreneurial hotbed that is Manhattan, just a subway ride away. I'm thrilled to offer you today an opportunity to ask questions about Columbia Business School's MBA program. Michael Robinson, again, admissions director at Columbia Business School and member of the class of 2001, will answer your questions during this Ask Me Anything. Michael leads strategic efforts centered around diversity, equality, equity, and inclusion, and spearheaded outreach efforts to expand the business school's presence in Africa and Southeast Asia. Prior to joining the business school in August 2002, he was an entrepreneur and had a seven-year stint running a music publicity firm with clients such as the platinum-selling Grammy winner Shaggy. He holds a BBA from Baruch College and an MBA from Columbia Business School. Originally from Ottawa, Canada, he grew up in Jamaica before immigrating to the U.S. as a teenager. He remains a 1990s hip-hop head. Now, that's a little bit about Michael. Here's what we're planning for the next 50 minutes or so. Michael has prepared a short presentation. Following the presentation, he'll answer your questions. You can post your questions at any time during the webinar in the question window. I'll choose those questions that feel I have the broadest applicability and Michael will address them. 
And actually, I think we're going to try a little bit of an experiment this time. We're actually, I'll, I'll review your questions and we'll ask you to actually speak your questions so that he can ask you follow-up questions too. So with that, thank you, um, Michael. Thanks uh, for your time today. It's all yours. Yes, and could you advance the slide, Linda, and th thank you so much. And I just want to kind of say one thing as well, is that like, um, this is just being the home of finance and media and entertainment and so on. It's also the birthplace of hip hop, so that's still my favorite music, even though I'm not as enamored with um, what passes for um, hip hop hits in 2019, but I'm still <laughs> in the 90s, but uh, it's, it's all good. Um, can you go to the next slide, Linda? Sure. So I am going to kind of fl um, flash through a small number of slides because I definitely want to um, get into the Q&A as quickly as, as possible, but I think it's important to, to give some basic information before we start the Q&A. Um, we are one of the world's leading resource institutions, but it's not this isolated um, I, a, academic ivory tower. This is more a place where we have big picture thinking that leads to, uh, combined with practical experience, that makes our students, our alumni equipped to navigate a very fast, uh, fast paced world that's changing more rapidly. Um, there are people on this call right now who will be working for companies in 15, 20 years that literally do not exist right now. They're probably not even an idea right now and so on, but they're going to be like important dominant uh, companies going forward. So I think it's important when you choose an MBA program to choose one that's going to be flexible, adaptable, but one that will give you a toolkit to succeed no matter what industry you decide to go in. Um, we have 18 areas of study at Columbia, and there is no required concentration. Um, so people basically have a clear sense of what they want to do, and then they choose electives that will help them get the toolkit that they need to succeed in life. Um, we have over 100 student organizations. So we are a peer-led uh, uh, um, organization. The students that we have in our classroom have lots of agency. They have lots of influence. And they drive change on our campus. Because we're in New York City, we have over 500 guest speakers every year. Um, we have over 45,000 alums across the globe. But I would say about 10,000 of those alums live in the, the tri-state area. So what that means is that our students have access to alums to help them navigate their careers as well. Um, we're finding that more and more of our students are doing in-semester internships. Um, I would say about 50% of the class before they graduate will do some internship, sometimes um, for cash compensation, sometimes for class credit, or sometimes just to get experience um, within a new field. Um, can you go to the next slide, um, Linda? Now, I want to kind of spend some more time talking about the student community. Um, so when you combine the class that starts in August that has about 550 students and the class that starts in January that has um, 200 students, that what we call the, the J term, um, we have over 700 students from all over the world with a variety of backgrounds. Um, when you start the program, you are broken up into clusters um, that have about 65 students, and um, the clusters are further subdivided into learning teams, and that learning team will be your core group where you'll do all your core classes. Um, almost half of the class is not from the U.S. and across six continents. Um, most of the students in our class have between three to eight years of experience. Now, for those of you that have more or less, know that that's fine as well. Um, I started the program when I was 32, so, um, so I know what it is to basically be slightly older as a student at Columbia as well. Again, we have two intakes. 
Now, there may be people on the call who are pretty set in terms of what they do from an industry perspective, and they don't need a summer internship to achieve their goals. If, that's, if that situation describes you to a T, you might want to consider the January program where you can basically get the degree done in 16 months um, as opposed to the typical 20-month program. And we also have a number of executive MBA formats as well. Next slide, please. Now, I think I mentioned before that we have 18 areas of concentration. There are only six listed here because otherwise the slide would be very, very crazy. But I'm sharing this slide only because um, a lot of people think of Columbia as this place where one goes only for finance. But the real growth that we're seeing is in entrepreneurship and also in technology and analytics. And in fact, our new dean who started July 1st, um, Dean McGlaris, believes very strongly that going forward, data science is going to be just as important as management science. So he's going to be building out a lot more courses um, in connection with engineering program, um, more coding classes. Um, and again, not that it, this does not mean that we're shifting an emphasis away from leadership, but it's just about us recognizing that the leader of the future is going to be, or going to need to be to be better at um, technology, better at data analytics, better at digital disruption. So we're going to do more integration with all those fields um, within the context of a larger management leadership ecosystem. So I guess the summary line is data science is going to be just as important as management science going forward, and we're going to give our graduates a toolkit to succeed in a, in a world that's changing more rapidly. Next slide. Now, many of you on the call are probably thinking about changing jobs and careers. So we have a very proactive career management center. So expect tons of one-on-one -on -one advising. Expect to see tons of alumni coaching. So we have close to 40 alums who have between 8 to 15 years of experience who come back to provide one-on-one -on -one guidance to our current students. Um, we also have about 30 second-year students who serve as peer career management fellows who are doing well within a certain industry sector, and they tend to advise people who are making career transitions. So the person who did well in consulting the year before um, will be an advisor to someone who is transitioning to the space or someone with a very strong entertainment background could be a CMC career fellow helping someone navigate a career path within the entertainment industry. And the last bullet there that you see is the execs in residence, and those are C-suite executives, some of whom have run multi-billion dollar companies who come back to campus two, three, four, sometimes four times a month to provide personal advice and guidance to our current students as well. But one of the things I want to say, and I'm speaking now as an admissions officer, is that the most important career resource that you have as an applicant is the person that you look at in the mirror every day, right? So we want people who take ownership for their own careers and their ownership, ownership for their own career success, um, who will use the tools and resources that we, we have, but, but they know that they own their own career success. Next slide. Now, I'll spend a few minutes here because I think this is the most important slide that I'll share today. Admissions can be broken down into like three buckets or three basic questions. Um, one centers around academics and intellectual curiosity. So we want to make sure that everyone we bring into our class can manage a very demanding and rigorous curriculum. So grades and test scores matter, but sometimes they don't matter as much as you think because 
most of the people who apply to our program have very strong grades and test scores. Um, I think the most important bullet on this page is under the professional promise banner. Um, we want to see people who are going to be truly successful in their chosen fields. So I like to say that we are in the human VC business where we look at candidates and then we're trying to get a sense of who will have the biggest exit or who will do best given the Columbia resource base in 10, 15, 20 years. And can you make an evidence-based argument as to why you're saying that? So if I looked at your resume, would I see a steady increase in the size, scope, and scale of the responsibilities being given to you? Are you being promoted faster than your peers? Um, so you're doing really well, but there's also a sense of humility and empathy about you where you have a history of, while doing well for yourself as an individual, you have a history of helping others um, and helping every team that you're a part of do better. Um, so we'll look at your resume. We'll look at the, the, the recommendations that you have. We'll look at your essay very, very closely and we'll look very closely at the interview. And in, in, in the essence, we're trying to get context. Um, one of the things I will say about the resume uh, as a word of advice is that it's not so much as, so don't think about your resume as getting a job, but think about your resume as providing context to your, um, to your professional potential. So it's not saying what you do, but how well are you doing it? So the more context and the more specific evidence that you can provide in terms of like, are you ranked in the top 10% of the people within your analyst class or the, the, of, or the people who are at your peer level? Um, things like that are much more helpful to us as well. The piece on personal characteristics is also very important because we want people who are truly well-rounded and multidimensional. So we want people who are interesting, um, and people who are interesting tend to do interesting things. The people that we like tend to be global in outlook, global in approach. Um, if you look at their passport, it has lots of stamps in it. Um, they, they, they like to be around people who are different, because we do expect the leaders of the future to have a higher level of cultural competence. So if you decide um, to leave post-MBA to work in a new country, to learn a new language and so on, we want people who are comfortable in that kind of environment. And that's like kind of the quick admissions slide summary. Next slide, please. Now in terms of the process, and everything here is also on our website, but know that Columbia has a rolling admissions process which basically means that we read the applications in the order that we get them. So all things being equal, the earlier you apply, the better your chances. Um, and just give you a quick rule of thumb. For those of you who are applying um, for the class that will start next fall, in August 2020, the early decision deadline is going to be within the first week of October, October 4th. And know that we get the bulk of our applicants who, um, who are applying after that binding early decision process, but know that um, if you look at that fellowship deadline, which is January 3rd, I would say we get historically 20 to 25% of all our applicants within a 48 hour window around that January 3rd deadline. So given that it's rolling admissions, right? If one applies at the end of December, instead of like waiting until January 3rd, you could technically be ahead of about a thousand people based on historical numbers in a process that rewards people who are in the front of the line. So kind of keep that in mind as well. The, the timelines aren't as critical for those applying for the January option, we see far fewer applicants for that program. So you can apply 
by the deadline and you'll be perfectly fine from admissions perspective, you know, because the, the class is more open because most people in the MBA admission space typically um, prefer to do the August program that will start next fall. But I still think of the January class as like Columbia's secret because it's a wonderful community um, and it's more global. So the class that starts in January will have, I would say, about 60% of the class will be um, from outside the U.S. and 40% will be U.S. citizens. Um, the class that will start in the fall, the numbers are reversed. Um, we'll, you'll see more entrepreneurs within the class that starts in January. Um, and one of the things, because the people in the program don't need a summer internship, they, they, they tend to be more risk-taking in terms of um, looking at their entrepreneurial dreams and aspirations. So if that's the environment that you'd like to be in because you want to be an entrepreneur yourself, um, shortly after the MBA program, you should consider the, the, the J term. Um, know that the, the, the last deadline, which is April 10th, um, we see few applicants applying, I'd say, from March to April. I'd say probably like less than 10% of the entire applicant pool. So again, try to get your application in sooner rather than, than later. But the thing I always say that like um, even if you apply late, you still have a shot of being admitted. If you don't apply, no shot. So, so like you will always miss the shot that you don't take. And with that, I think we can probably go to, to, to questions. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. We do have questions coming in um, from Sumit. Can international students apply for the January 2020 intake and the October 4th deadline? Yes, yes. I mean, so, so essentially, the, the, I mean, everyone can apply to any, any program. Um, and in fact, as I just mentioned, um, the January class is about 60% non-U.S. I, I prefer to say U.S. and non-U.S. because I think everyone is international, so <laughs> that tends to be my own okay. All right, great. And then we have, if I've mispronounced somebody's name, please, for, please forgive me. Pilar asks, can I apply in the early decision round as I'm decided about CBS with just an OK GMAT and introduce in the application a date with a new GMAT? Or do you recommend that I just wait for the regular decision and enter with just one GMAT score? Thank you. All right. So, so, so like, I, I, I tend to answer questions in a way where, like, I, I just kind of table set and give people in information and people make the decision that that's best for them. So if you think about the, the application process as a timeline, with early decision, all things being equal, the earlier one applies, the better your chances. So we are more open to taking academic risk earlier in the process rather than later in the process because the class is wide open, right? Um, in terms of any supplemental information, um, we accept new information as long as it comes within three weeks of that initial submission. So sometimes if, if one has taken the test and you really believe that with more practice you can get a higher score that reflects your true ability within a one month time frame, I, I would set that date for the retest, um, submit with, with your current score, but, but indicate on the application and in the text box and also in the optional essay that you are retaking on a certain date so we have that information. But there are some people, though, where they've taken the test three, four, five times and they're kind of stuck within a certain band. If, if that describes any person on this call, then I would just like focus on the other elements of the application. There's something that I've, that I've seen in my 17 years of admissions, and that is, and again, th there's no scientific evidence for this. This is just, more, just anecdotes and 17 years of conversations and 17 years of experience. The most interesting people in our class, the people in our class who I think have the most potential to be the most dynamic leaders in the class, 
are really the people who were straight A students or had like a 770 or 780, 780 GMAT. Now, for those of you who have perfect test scores and perfect grades, wonderful. But, but often times the best leader, that's just not their experience, you know? And if you think about what happens, right, if in our process we're looking at people and if everything, if everything is comparable, then why would you take someone who's a 690 and reject someone who's a 740 if everything else is the same, right? So if you, if you go by that log logic, right, the people that have lower scores have something that we either don't see a lot of or something that is super special, right? Um, so that person in the, in the bottom third of the class, academically, that group of people, they, they tend to have some very interesting and powerful stories and some wonderful examples of demonstrated leadership beyond what we see in the class. And the last thing I'll say on this, right, is that 20 years from now, no one, no one is going to ask you, what were your grades at Columbia Business School? What test score did you get? No one will ask you that. But they will care deeply about the kind of leader that you were the teams that you're able to lead and build, the kind of company that you're able to lead and build, um, or the organization, the nonprofit group that you're able to, um, to, to, to found that made a difference in the world. That's, that's what really, I mean, life matters. Test scores, at the end of the day, don't once you get through this process. That's for sure. I, uh... Somebody asked me what my GMAT score was, and I honestly don't remember. <laughs> so anyways, okay, Emmanuel asks, um, hi, grateful for, for the presentation. How does an international applicant qualify for scholarship packages? So essentially, just apply by the, by the deadline, right? Um, and, and let me be clear, because in the introduction, um, Linda mentioned that I was very involved in outreach to Southeast Asia, and also to Africa as well. So, I mean, I've, I've been to Thailand maybe five times in the, in the last four years. Now, a good salary in Bangkok is $20,000 in, in $20,000 US dollars. That's a very good salary. Um, that's not a lot in, in, the, in the context of living in New York City. Um, so we keep that in mind, um, and the numbers are even more challenging if you're applying from certain countries on the African continent as well. So we are mindful of, of what people are making when they apply, and we, we take that into account when making um, need-based fellowship decisions, but there, but, and that's controlled by the financial aid office that's independent from the Office of Admissions. Now, admissions does have a pool of funds that we have but those are merit-based fellowships, and that's a combination of leadership potential and academics as well. So, so we have two primary funding buckets that the school controls, and then, the, of course, there are loans. And through Prodigy Finance, it's also possible for someone who is not a U.S. citizen to, uh, to qualify for loans without a U.S. loan co-signer. Okay, great. Thank you. I had I had forgotten that we were going to experiment with having um, uh, the applicants actually speak their questions. So I'm going to start the experiment now. Okay, and I'm going to start it if it's okay with um, James, who asks. Well, let me ask. I'm going to unmute you, James. And um, you, James, you asked a question, and you are welcome to to express it now. You there? Maybe he doesn't have a mic. If well, not, I'll ask. Are you there, James? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Hi, James. Hi. Thanks for the question. Um, I wanted to ask: Does applying early decision affect a uh, potential merit scholarship awarded? Um, it it does, but not in the way that you think, right? So, so it does in a sense because if you apply early decision, that process literally ends before we've started to fully evaluate the people who are applying. Um for the, the, the class for what we call regular decision. So the, the, the deadline for applying for a merit-based fellowship is January 3rd of, of 2020. And by that time, the people who applied, who applied early decision, they've applied by October, 
and they've pretty much found out whether or not they got admitted um, by the end of November, early December at the, at the latest. So while we are starting to make some awards, um, that, that happens later. So in essence, that person has to basically make pay a deposit of $6,000 without knowing whether or not they got um, a merit-based fellowship. So for, for some people, that, that they, they, they want to have full information before making a decision. So if that's your situation, then applying regular decision might be the way to go. But so, so again, there, there are pros and cons because some people want to know um, whether or not they got admitted and they, they want to um, figure out the funding piece later on. So depending on um, your tolerance for risk or, or comfort without, without have, making a decision without full information, then that person would apply or not apply to, through the early decision process. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, Michael. And here we have, let me take another question. This is from Nandan. And again, Nandan, I'm going to unmute you so you can un unmute yourself if that's okay. And you can ask your question. It's a good one. Oops. Um, okay, so apparently I cannot un unmute Nandan, so I'm going to just speak the question. What does a candidate with 10 years experience, uh, what shot does a candidate with 10 years experience have? Is the J term more suitable? Wait, I, it, what, what, I didn't hear some, I, I missed something, what, Linda. What shot, what, what chance does shot. a candidate, right, with 10 years experience have? Is the J term more suitable? Well, you're talking to someone who got admitted to Columbia having more than 10 years of experience. So, so <laughs> it's sort of concept for me. So, 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 I, so, so let me give you some, 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 some data. I, I would say slightly more than 10% of the class is in their 30s. Um, there's always one or two people who are in their, their 40s. The record at Columbia is 64. That is an outlier, right? <laughs> but but I, I, you always have people in their 30s. Maybe one or two in in their 40s, but 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 it's about 10 percent in the pool. Um, but know that the applicant pool also doesn't have lots of people who are who have 10 plus years of experience as well. People tend to apply within that three to eight year experience window. So so I think that the the, the chances are comparable, um, but the story has to kind of make sense. Right. So typically, the people who are applying um, in their 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 thirties typically are, are using the MBA credential to accelerate within a certain path, and and they're not kind of starting from scratch again. So so say that 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 person is like, I am applying to Columbia. I am 39 years old, um, and I'm doing this thing. But 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 post MBA, I, I want to take a, an entry level job in investment banking as a transition when most of the people who are hiring for that are, are going to be like 15 years younger, um, then that could be problematic in terms of like, can this person really make this goal actually happen, right? So, 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 so again, the, the narrative that you express in the application has to be one that makes sense. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question. All right, I'm gonna again continue my uh, experiment. Sarav, you have a question about um, renewable energy. Give me one second to unmute you, and you can unmute yourself. Here we go. Sarav, what's your question? And a good question. Hi, hi, Linda. Thanks uh, for the opportunity. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, you know, about uh, renewable energy. So I come with a seven-year experience in the oil and gas sector in India, and uh, my objective uh, to do an MBA from CBS is to make a switch into renewable energy. Now, mm -hmm. I wanted to understand the scope while I have gone through, you know, a lot of clubs that operate out of your uh, campus, but what, is, what exactly is, uh, you know, renewable energy consulting as a career prospect from the CBS, if you could help me with that. Um, hmm. I, I, I don't have a lot more information than what you've already found through, through, through the clubs, but, but what, what I, I can give you a, a name um, and uh, someone to, to basically do some research around. Um, but look at this name, uh, Google this name on our website, um, Pro Professor Bruce Usher. 
So he is the, the, the co-director of our Tamer Center, um, and he's someone who um, was an industry leader in the carbon um, finance space and sold his company for a considerable sum before becoming um, an adjunct professor um, over a decade ago. And, and he is a recognized leader w within the space that you, that you describe. Um, so there are conferences that they, they have on campus through our, through our social enterprise club. Um, there are a number of, of electives that, that happen each year as well. From an admissions perspective though, right, let, let, let me give you a word of advice. Um, that I hope can be helpful as well. And this, this is, and for, for those who are not interested in this space, I want to frame it in a way that can apply to other people as well. If, if, you're, if you plan to do something post-MBA where the number of people who are hired is relatively small compared to other groups of, of students on campus, um, if I were reading your application, there are a couple things I would look for. One, has, has he done research and reached out to current students who are pursuing a similar path? So we have a couple of green energy clubs on, on campus. And if you go to our website and look under the chat with a current student tab, you will see a list of about 220 current students who are volunteers, and you can search them by industry. So, so you, you can basically like try to find someone who's in one of the clubs around sustainability. If you're inter interested in, in media and entertainment, that's another option. But any kind of niche space, you, you can find students who are there doing something similar, um, and then try to connect with a, with a couple of them. And then one, you, you'll get a sense of what is the experience academically for that person who has a similar profile. What's what's the experience academically? What's the experience in terms of career support? Um, what's the experience in terms of professional conferences that, that, that are happening? So that when I look at your application, I, I would see that you've basically done a number of things within that space um, to, to really get a sense of the available ecosystem and set of resources at, at, at Columbia. But, but again, to your specific question, um, start with, with Bruce Usher. Um, check out the, the, the Hermes list of volunteers looking for sustainability and green energy and sustainability um, and build from there and you'll find some fantastic resources. Great. Thank you for the question and the answer, Michael. Is Usher spelled A-S-H-E-R or U-S-H-E-R or some other way? Oh, U-S. U-S. Okay. Like, like, the, like the singer. And, well, okay. you know who that singer is. And I actually don't, Bruce. but we won't go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Rishabh, I'm going to just ask Rishabh's questions because it's a fairly straightforward one. Do any of the concentrations at CBS carry STEM certification? Um, not at Thank this you. point, um, but there have been conversations, but there, there's been no um, change at, at, at the point of this call. Okay. Um, May, I'm going to ask you if you're willing to ask your question. Let me unmute you. And uh, I think it's a question with broad applicability. So are you there? May, you there? You hear me? No. Okay, the question is, I'm concerned about my low undergrad GPA. While I think I can strongly address this issue through the essay, would taking the GMAT instead of the EA further help address the issue, assuming, assuming scores are both on high, uh, high percentiles? Um, so we're, we're test agnostic, right? So, so, so if you prefer to take the DEA, that's fine. Um, so, so the committee won't give the GMAT more weight than the EA, the, the executive assessment or the GRE. But one of the things I will say though, right, is that like going back to what I had on that slide in terms of the primary question, um, which was, are we convinced? that the person can handle um, a rigorous curriculum. So, so with, with some candidates, um, something happened with, to them where they're a young person and for whatever reason, they weren't able to, to get the grades in college that were reflective of their true ability and, and potential, right? But we're admitting the person that you are today, right? So then what is the offset going to be? 
So, so what you, ver you see very rarely in the class is someone who has a low test score and a low GPA as well. Right, so, so th there has to be like some evidence that convinces us that this person is going to be okay. Right. So, so if you are more comfortable taking the GRE or the executive assessment or the GMAT, then that, that's, we're agnostic. Um, it doesn't matter to us. But, but getting a competitive score is, is helpful. Now, the little trick though is that like, since we've just started taking that executive assessment in, in the last year, um, there's not as much data that schools have in terms of what's the correlation between e executive assessment scores and performance in the actual classroom. So at this point, there's m much more flexibility in um, looking at EA scores because we have less data in terms of like what exactly is a good score and, and how does that relate to like um, performance in the classroom. Thank you. Really good question. Really good answer. Um, again, I'm going to uh, Renak. You're going to be the next questioner. You also had a very good question. And again, I'm going to un unmute you. You are there. There's the traffic in the background. Renak, do you want to ask your question or should I pose it for you? All right, let's, I'm going to pose it again. No problem. Um, what would be a comfortable GMAT range for the overrepresented Indian male applicant pool? Thanks in advance. <laughs> right. um, That's a very con. You know, they're concerned about it. So. Okay. So okay. So so um, I, I'm I'm going to answer that question, but do that question as at at the same time. I, I'll show you how how I do it. Right. So um, okay. so. No, no matter what top school you look at, right, there are certain profiles that tend to score better than the median score that you see um, within that school profile. And typically, people that have technical backgrounds, they work as, as engineers and so on, tend to cluster above the median, right? So if our median score is like, was like 730, I think it was last fall it was like 736 this year was like 732 so, so so if you say like the median score is between 730 and 740 at Columbia um, the people who are engineers or have strong technical backgrounds are clustering above that right now there's certain applicants from certain countries where the bulk of the applicants tend to kind of fit a very technical profile and I'll just stop there you stop there. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so that, that, that so, so that that should give you like some kind of some some kind of like if you if you listen closely, there's like real context there that I think answered the question. Okay. Fine. I like to say I'm going to inject something here that whether you are an Indian male applicant or an American management consultant, this is Linda speaking. I'm not an employee of Columbia, so I'm speaking for myself and for accepted. You have to make yourself into a group of one, an individual with unique talents, abilities, promise, uh, personal characteristics. That's every applicant's task. For some applicants, it might be a little bit more difficult. For some applicants, it looks a little easier, but it's every applicant's task. I don't know, Michael, how you feel about that, but uh, I, 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 I agree with that. You know, um, but but the thing I but I but the thing I I will say though, right, is is that like in our pool. Okay, so let me let's forget. I'm gonna step away from from nationality and kind of focus on what what people do, right? Mm -hmm. So we have tons of folks who work in traditional finance who are applying to Columbia Business School, right? Um, and many of them because they have technical backgrounds, they work with numbers all the time they're clustering above the median score, right? So if, if you're an investment banker from New York City when we have like tons of those applicants and you're below the median, right, then what does that person have to do, right? So, so then think about well, what I said before, what, when, when I said um, some of the most interesting, the people with the best potential tend to be 
um, lower than average with, with, with it from an academic perspective in, in our class, but they're, they have the most potential, but it's demonstrated, right? So, 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 so they, they come from a part of the pool that's really strong, but they have done more as an emerging leader than the others who have similar backgrounds. So, so when, I, when you read the application, their boss who has worked in that particular space for the past 20 to 30 years will, will say, she is one of the best I've seen. Let me tell you why I think she is going to, she has the potential to be this transformational figure within our industry. And they're offering specific guidance and context as to why they believe that. So when you look at the, the, the resume, you see accomplishment that is more real, more robust than what we typically see. So, so they're just like, oh, th you know, oh, th th this person is from this profile. Um, the scores are a bit weaker, but they're, they're one of the best in the class. Let me tell you. Let me tell you why. That that piece is essential, and that 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 advice is advice for everyone, because. When we build a class, right, we are literally building a class, uh, a class of individuals that we hope where the, the sum of the parts is, is, is bigger than the sum of the individual contributors. Right. Okay. Um, I actually just sent to the, the chat window a resource that we accept and have on the importance of, of, uh, of individuating yourself in, in the applicant process, application process rather. And what I sometimes do, and I could, I can do it briefly here. If, if Michael, can I just take a minute to run a little experiment please, here? Please, okay. Please. All right. Um, some of this is going to be redundant to what we did at the beginning, but, but bear with me, everybody. How many of you work in finance or consulting? If you do, please raise your hand or have worked in it since college. Everybody who's worked in finance or consulting, please raise your hand. Everybody who's worked in finance or consulting, please raise your hand. Okay. All right. All right. So everybody who's worked in finance or consulting, please raise your hand. We have about 43%. Okay. I'm going to put the hands down. How many of you have worked on a consulting project uh, geared towards introducing a new pharmaceutical drug to the South American market? Okay. How, again, how many of you have worked on a consulting project uh, geared towards introducing a new drug to the South American market? We have 5%. So it was 43% for the first question, finance or consulting, 5% for uh, introducing a consulting project geared towards introducing a new, new drug. Okay. How many of you, again, I'm going to ask you to put your down, hands down, how many of you have volunteered in some capacity in college or since? Raise your hand. Okay. And we are about 47%. Again, have volunteered in college or since? Please raise your hand. We're at 47, 49%. Okay, I'm going to put all hands down. How many of you have volunteered at a camp as a camp counselor for a um, uh, intellectually challenged child where you were one-on-one -on -one with that individual, let's say a teen. Okay. All right. Oh, I'm surprised about 15% of you. Okay, great. Okay. So what was the difference between the two sets of questions in the question window, please? What was the difference between the two sets of questions? Right, Anthony, they were the, the second set of, was more specific, identifying niche, specific, specific, specifics versus general. Good, Rachel. Specificity and making yourself distinctive. Exactly, Sebastian. If you write and talk in specifics, you're going to make yourself distinctive. If you talk about yourself as an Indian male engineer, you will blend in with all the other Indian male engineers. But 
if you work in a specific area, you had specific impacts. Yes, I'm going to get your question in a second, Clayton. Just hold on. Um, then you are going to be distinguishing yourself. If you talk about your passions, your interests in specific terms, not volunteering, but what kind of volunteering, not hobbies, but what hobbies, you are going to be distinguishing yourself. And now let's get back to your questions because this is the Columbia AMA, not the Linda Abraham AMA. So I'm going to get back to it right now. Um, okay. Clayton has a question. I'm going to unmute him and let him ask his question. Go for it, Clayton. You there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thank you very much for doing this. I appreciate that. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how the school's integrating in the community right there since it's pretty much downtown New York and um, it mentioned the internships during the semester. Um, so you said, I mean, integrating with, with what I, I missed something. How the school doing what? Um, so um, I'm assuming that they have several different academic clubs, like a real estate club or investing club or volunteer community service club, and just kind of how how they're working together with uh, being right downtown New York City. Well, well, okay. So, so we're not so much downtown. We're, we're more further uptown. Um, so, 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 so Columbia is relatively close to. I started um, Harlem, which is a mostly African American community, so that, that's further up, uptown. Um, so there, so there, so, so it's there are a number of things happening and, and going on. So, so there, there are some students who want to work with people of color in terms of building and expanding businesses. So, so, so there are people who are doing that. Um, but then we're we're also in in the heart of New York City, so so there there are folks who want to engage with clubs that that have no connection to quote unquote like a do gooder type experience. It's just like they're they're totally focused on advancing their their careers and and so on. Um, there are folks who are totally immersed in cultural activities um, within the, the New York environment. Um, there are folks on campus where their focus is off outside the US. So there's things like Pangea where like I, I, I want to basically focus my volunteer or community activity or, or club activity uh, on something that's more global where I'm working um, on a project in an emerging market. So that could be Southeast Asia, that, that could be on the African continent, that could be in Latin America and so on. So there, there are projects that clubs do um, that run the gamut. We have over a hundred clubs on campus, so it really depends on what you want to do. There literally is an interest group um, that you can tap into. There are folks on campus where, like, they they want to learn more about wine. There are folks on campus where they literally want to learn how to brew beer. There are folks on campus who want to basically work. I mean. Their activity is is working with with women who are marginalized. Um, they're, they're, they might be on public assistance and so on, and they're trying to basically do things to get get that marginalized person into the workforce. You know, like interview prep, um, get, getting that first suit to get that first job. So, depending on what you want to do, there is an interest that you can tap into. Okay, no, that's great. I appreciate that. Yeah. But where 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 do, where do you live? Uh, I live in Texas. Texas, okay. Where in Texas? Uh, Fort Worth, so Dallas, okay. Fort Worth. Complex. Cool. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Clayton and Michael. All right, next question is, let's see. Got lots of questions here to choose from. Um, Okay, Naman, I'm going to unmute you if you're there, and you can ask your question. Go for it. Thanks, Linda. Uh, Michael, my question is, what is the biggest evaluation metric you would look in a reapplicant, especially from last application season and somebody who applied in 
April of 19, which is the final round, right? Because okay. one would expect not a lot would have changed professionally and personally, of course, barring a few factors. Yes. So, so if if someone applied late in the process, um, like the equivalent of third round at other programs, and again, we don't have ro we have rolling that round. Um, but again, the later one applies, the, the lower your, your chances just based on the way the math plays out. So, so sometimes for some reapplicants, it's just a timing thing. Now, in my 17 years of admissions experience here at Columbia, um, the reapplicants who have had most success typically are reapplying during the early decision window. So they, they apply at the top of the funnel. Got it. OK. Thanks. Thank you. And, and to just add one more thing. Um, we would not expect to see great difference between an applicant from April um, and an applicant who applies four or five months later. So, so, so typically, they're in the, in the same job. Um, they, they may have a project that they, they, they've been working on so that they, they can basically like update their resume. But for most people, there's not dramatic difference in a four to five month period in a resume profile. So we, so, but we would not hold that against the, the person as well. Very often in this process, it, it's the, the timing piece can be a big factor um, in the admissions process. Okay, great. Thank you very, very much. Next up is Anchor. Anchor, oh, your mouth self muted. Okay, you mute yourself, so I will pose your question. Um, let me find it again. But I know it's one that um, Michael is particularly well suited to answer. Here it is. How has CBS invested in US underrepresented minorities? Are there specific programs, scholarships, and how has the investment paid off so far? I'm not quite sure what that means, but. All right, so it's very interesting. So, so um, th 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 that's an issue that, 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 that matters a lot to me. Um, and as, as we said in the introduction, right, like I, I travel to many different countries. Um, and one, one of the things that, that you find, right, is, is that some of the issues that you, you think um, are an American story tend to have global parallels. So, so there's always some group in every society that is, is marginalized for whatever reason. Um, sometimes it could be because of the God that you pray to. Sometimes it could be because of the economic class that you're in. Sometimes it, it's because of the person you love and so on. So in every single society, there is some marginalized group that is, is trying to basically create their own sense of agency and so on. So, so I, I want to kind of answer that question from a more global perspective because you, you heard me talk before about cultural competence um, and empathy, right? And I, I think if we, not only at the school of Columbia, but we as, as a world and society, if, if we get better at that, you know, um, where we learn how to manage and leverage difference and appreciate that difference um, and celebrate that difference, um, then we end up with with a better world. And I know that that may sound hokey, um, but but for me that that means as an admissions officer, it's important to, for for us to have a class that that has people from over fifty countries speaking dozens of, of languages. But then you also want to make sure that you're doing more. Um, on the funding piece where it's not only the very wealthy and super elite from, the, from those countries, but people who work hard um, and have real potential are not denied that potential because of the fact that they're not super wealthy. So, so th th there, there's something to be said for like what, what do you do to address all different forms of inequality as well. So, so, so there are more classes, more electives. I think we've been more tactical and proactive in terms of, like, I mean, 
how do we help? Who do we help? And so on. Um, but in, in, in a way that is broad based. Now, let me be clear. Um, I don't think there's any school that doesn't have lots of work to do because the, as we as a society and we as a world have lots of work to do. But the thing is, is like, I, I, I want people to, to figure out what part they, they want to play. So wh when I look at applicants, when I look at applications, um, I do look for people who have a history of engaging with people who are different um, from them and have a certain kind of comfort with, with that because like the more people that you have within your class like that, the better the experience is going to be for everyone and the better they will be at managers and leaders in the future. Great, thank you very much. Okay, here is another question. Um, Actually, Alexander has a lot of questions. And Alexander, if it's okay with you, I'm going to unmute you. Now, you had several questions. I'm going to ask you to ask the one that you want to ask the most. How's that? Okay. Sure, that works for me. Okay, go for it. Uh, so my last question was, if we're kind of in the process of preparing our application today and we're approaching the October 4th deadline for the next August start, are we better off applying in say mid to late October or November, or if we submit in say late September or you know a week or two before the October 4th deadline, is that is that still advisable by you? Um, and the reason why I, I'm asking Wait, so you're actually, is, are you so you're saying you're, you're not applying early decision and you're applying regular decision, but you want to apply very early. Is that is that, is that right? Well, I, um, I, for for me, it's more a question of of having. Uh, having a, a a strong application ready to go okay um, and, and whether or not that's the case for october 4th i, I mean i it, it, could, it could definitely be the case for october 4th it, i've just been told that there are a few so few or few enough spots that will be that, that will remain available in say the last couple of weeks leading up to that deadline because you're doing rolling admissions even even leading up to the early decision deadline that you're you're better off waiting you, you might be better off waiting till mid mid October late October November to actually submit when there is are more slots available for that next deadline um, uh, uh, slotting um, wh where do you get the information from I'm curious um, admissions consultant. My, my admissions consultant <laughs> okay um, I okay I okay I, I'm, I'm gonna push back right so, so let, 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 let me turn speak the way we work yep. um so think of a line of 5500 applicants right and for us to build a class in the fall we probably are going to admit 780 to 800 people um because everyone we admit won't come so to so you're making approximately 800 people to get a class of 550 at the end right so when we made like 850 minus 800 minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, right? So, so it's not like we're, we, we have a thing where we're going to admit a certain number of people for early decision and a certain number of people it's like, no, like, like what do we have in the class? You know, so, and, and then when the class is full, we stop. Um, so, so when one applies earlier, um, the class is, open so there's more space so we're, we're not trying to you know block something now the, the thing i would add as well is to provide more context we do only review the people who are applying early decision and then once we do that and which will probably will complete that um historically by the end of november first few days of December historically, but every year it could change. Um, and then that's when we start reviewing the people who applied regular decision. So someone could actually ap uh, apply regular decision um, October 15th, but we won't start looking at that application until we have first reviewed everyone for January and everyone for early decision, then we start to review stuff. So, so then we'll start looking at those people um, probably by December. And and then that that's and then we we start to make decisions and 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 we'll make an announcement that will say okay well we finished our process we are going to start reviewing regular decision now 
and then people will start hearing probably like three to four weeks whether or not they got interviewed once we make that announcement. But the, the applications that you've received to date uh, for the October 4th, August entry deadline? Um, you mean, you mean, you mean um, early decision? Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah, sorry. For okay, the early all right. Deadline. Uh, have you been reviewing those to date and have you started to kind of uh, yes, uh, yes, yes. figure out who will be advancing effectively? Yes, already? yes. So we have... But, but again, that number is really small because people tend to start applying come, I, I would say, like two weeks before, and then we're going to get a big crush of applicants um, mm -hmm. ar around that deadline. So, okay. so it's been trickling in. So, so we're, we're probably get, we're, we're getting files assigned to us right now, but they're probably mm, literally about 20% of what we'll get on a week-to-week -week basis um, come November. Right, right. Okay. Okay, perfect. Thank, thanks so much for the help. Thank you, Alex, Alexander, and thank you, uh, Michael. We're going to take one more question. I think it's about all we have time for. We've run over, and Michael has graciously agreed to extend. So I'm going to unmute Sebastian. Sebastian, can you ask a question? Yes. Thanks, Linda and Michael, for your time today. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes, I hear you. Perfect. Perfect. Well, let me first ask my question concisely, and then I can add a transition answer to the question. My first question is, how can one start engaging and collaborating with the CBS community already? And, then, and you're asking before you're accepted. Correct. And then the, the 10 seconds context is that I'm an analyst for McKinsey Company, and besides my almost three, three and a half years of regular analyst experience. I have extensive experience in recruiting for McKinsey and also giving coaching sessions for McKinsey applicants. Applicants, And I've been thinking about, for instance, one idea of um, connecting with a consulting club and starting helping current students with coaching sessions for, for case study interviews, for instance. But I would love to hear any other recommendations. Um, okay, so, so McKinsey, so you're with McKinsey, you said, right? Correct. Yeah. So, so McKinsey historically is is the biggest recruiter on campus historically. Um, so sometimes their years when they're, they're literally like 50 people. Want, uh, we graduate 750 people and 50 go to McKinsey, right? So, so um, we roll deep there. And and literally like M M McKinsey almost like has a, a person on staff here. I mean, at least I mean year round advising mm -hmm. students. Um, and, and then we have tons of folks who came from the firm as well. So, so um, it, it's, it's strong there, right? So, but, so one of the things I, I would say though, right, I, you, you can still engage with, with current students, um, but in terms of like the resources available for consulting, people who want to go into consulting, it's really, really strong here. Um, so, so there, there, there might be a, another way that you, you might w want to explore on ways to, to be helpful. Um, but, but, but for, for me as an admissions officer, I, I, I'm, I, I kind of focus more on you as an applicant and what your potential is and so on, and uh, like what kind of leader he, he, he is going to be. Um, so, so. Things that you did independent of, of Columbia would be of more interest to me as an applicant. You know, so 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 where, where are you applying? I mean, where, where are you based? Where are you from? I am from Costa Rica, actually. Costa Rica. Okay. Yes. Planning so, on so, okay. All right. Well, I I haven't been to Costa Rica yet, but I'd like to go one, one day. So so awesome. so even something because I think Linda had mentioned something about volunteering and so on, right? So 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 then like. If if you're like working with, with groups of young people to to expose them to the space the consulting space, you know, um, where where the pe people who typically don't have access to um, a firm like McKinsey, you know, and it's like well, even even though you came from this high school that typically don't doesn't recruit um, or McKinsey doesn't recruit from, mm -hmm. like you can still do this. You know, um, and, and then you, you're able to basically like enhance access to opportunity for someone who didn't have it, um, and, and and use the McKinsey brand and experience to help that group of people. 
that would be of more interest to me. Got it. Perfect. You know, so, so, you know, um, and, and, and to me, it's like, what, what kind of leader w will you choose to be with the people that you're around right now? Do, do you make the people that you're around right now better, and how do you do that? Much appreciated. Thank you. Again, great questions, great answers. I want to thank both the, the applicants who are here for coming. I want to thank certainly Michael Robinson for the wonderful presentation, his time, and his great insight into Columbia Business School admissions process. He has a hard stop now. I want to respect that, and I'm, we've, we've gone over. I also want to respect the applicant's time. So applicants, as you leave, please take a moment to complete our short survey. We really value your feedback. We, we use it to improve both the AMAs, webinars, et cetera. If you want to review the AMA in the future, it'll be available early next week online, and we're gonna send out an email letting you know when it is available for you to review. Thank you again, and best of luck with, with, with your applications. Michael, again, big thank you to you. Good luck, everybody. Take care. And thank you, Linda, for the opportunity, and good luck to everyone. You're welcome. Oh, just one more thing. Michael, there have been lots of thank yous coming in. I just wanted to share that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And please, like, stay in touch. And I, I, I'd also re recommend, right, that you also register for a Columbia-specific webinar as well through or, or some sort of event because we do track those events as well in our system. And we, we, we sometimes that can make a difference in an applicant's profile if, if everything else is equal. Sounds good. So please stay in touch. Sounds good. Thank you for the great last-minute tip. And good luck, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.